Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll be the moderator for this event. My name is Nick Witkowski, and I'm a professor of history um, uh, of Asian religions here at NTU in Singapore. This is the third and final event for the semester in our NTU history seminar series. And I wanted to note that this event is co-sponsored by our new initiatives, the NTU South Asia Initiative and the NTU Religion, Trust and Society Initiative. I am very excited today to welcome Professor Sonam Katru to NTU. Uh, Sonam Katru is an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. He works on the history of philosophy, centering on the history of Buddhist philosophy and literature in pre-modern South Asia. I'm just going to very briefly share. My screen here because it will show you, I hope, uh, the book that we're going to be talking about today. This is uh, someone's um, brand new book, Other Lives, Mind and World in Indian Buddhism. Um, this book, uh, I believe, and many others I think agree with me, um, uh, recently published um, this year, promises to be a game-changing book in the intellectual history of Indian philosophy. Um, Other Lives, Mind and World in Indian Buddhism um, was published by Columbia University Press, and this book is the basis for our discussion. Though expansive in its scope, drawing from pre-modern Indian Buddhists as well as modern global philosophy, Other Lives is centered on the work of the great Buddhist philosopher and scholastic Vasubandhu. Other Lives is a study of Vasubandhu's compact but philosophically expansive book, The 20 Verses. In Other Lives, Sanam compels his reader to consider the range of experiences typically understood to be outside the norm of our workaday existence. What is the relationship between dreams and waking life? What is the relationship of our experience to that of non-humans? And according to Sanam, Vasubandhu's 20 verses is an invitation to readers to explore experiences in dreams and to inhabit the experiences of non-human beings that are well known to the world of Buddhist cosmology. These include the karmic fates of living beings to end up as animals who are sentient but brutish, hungry ghosts who roam the world unsatiated by food or drink, and beings tortured for their moral transgressions in hell. Part of the reason why Sanam's work is such a tour de force is that he takes seriously Vasubandhu's interest in the seemingly nebulous, distant, and comic tragically foreign experiences of dream time and the non-human. And for this reason, I'm delighted that Sonam Katru is here today to discuss other lives, mind, and world in Indian Buddhism. The format for today is as follows. First, uh, Sonam and I will briefly discuss his academic background. Sonam will then give an uh, overview of other lives uh, for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And after this overview, Sonam and I will discuss other lives for about 40 minutes or so. Finally, there'll be about 30 minutes for question and answer. So during uh, the overview and discussion, please enter your questions in the chat window. I will collate those questions and try to get through as many as possible afterwards. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to come on and actually speak. So though I would appreciate everybody putting their questions into the chat window as early as you think of them, um, please be ready to come on and ask the questions. We really wanna have um, as robust a discussion uh, as possible. Okay, so I guess where I'd like to start, um, Sonam, welcome <laughs> to NTU. <laughs> um, uh, where I'd like to start is to ask you to talk a bit about your intellectual genealogy. Um, what is it that brought you not just to this book, but to Buddhist studies, to Indology? Um, um, why even be an academic? <laughs> so you can freely answer um, what you wish about your background. Well, um, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me and for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here in conversation with you. And for hopefully for reasons that will become clearer, given your work on historiography and, and your interests in, well, other lives in your, in your own historiographical way. 
the lives of subalterns and the lives that get overlooked in the history of Buddhist studies and South Asian pasts. Um, so this is, this is fantastic for me. I couldn't imagine a better conversation partner. I, I don't know about a full genealogy. Um, that as even our so many Buddhist texts tell us that our pasts are beginningless and we can always recontextualize the stories we tell about ourselves and or the objects with which we are bound. And that maybe often we are not the best storytellers of our own lives, right? It could, um, so with that caveat in mind, I'll tell you a little bit about how this book came to be and maybe that'll point um, to ways in which, how I find myself entangled in, in these fields. Um, I think if you were, if I had to stand on one leg, so to speak, and tell you where this book came from, I think it, would, it was born in a conversation with an extraordinary philosopher and friend, Rajam Raghunathan in Cambridge. And we had just, I think, heard a talk on the 20 verses of Vasubandhu that had managed, it was a very sophisticated presentation for philosophers, and it had managed somehow to make absolutely no reference to the vast majority of the 20 verses. It particularly made no reference to dreams or the experiences of hungry ghosts or hell or um, the, the allusions to stories at the end of the 20 verses. And in conversation, we asked ourselves, and I can't remember who pressed the other on this issue, but the, the question was simple. If Vasubandhu could have made his arguments without appealing to hell and dreams and things like that, well, why the hell did he not do it? And if he couldn't, what exactly was the work um, that these things, these appeals were doing? And that, that was many, many years ago. And so it's some, somehow it's been rankling in there in a way that I needed some account of why a philosopher of Vasubandhu's rank, I mean, intellectual rank, uh, thought he needed these elements in the text that resist easy translation or easy transposition uh, to contemporary Anglophone context. So I think the book was born there. And, 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 and I like that it was born in conversation and it was born out of wonderment rather than certainty or anything like that. So thank you, Rajam. I did not, um, among the many, many problems with this book, a pandemic book, if ever there was one, is that I didn't get to um, expansively thank or put in everything that um, I think needs to be said about the 20 verses. And one of those is a, is a thank you to Rajam. So thank you for allowing me to, to say, um, to acknowledge that conversation. In the genealogy bit, Nick, would you mind if I beg off it for now and allow it to filter in um, into our conversation of where I come from? And Because honestly, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't even know what here the, the here is. Like, um, I, I feel at the intersection of, of, of several uh, academic streams. So there's, there's, the, there's the history of philosophy and philosophy side, and then there's the Sanskrit Indology side. And then there's the Buddhist studies things and these intersect, but they're not the same, right? So I like to think, um, well, I, I, <laughs> I like to think that I play all sides against the other. So you know, when I'm doing philosophy, it's like, well, I'm not actually a philosopher, I'm a Sanskritist. And when I'm the Sanskritist, I'm like, I'm not really a Sanskritist. <laughs> 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 I'm a philosopher. I hope I don't do that too often. But I do feel like uh, the work is, um, and that I myself am interstitial. I like to think that I, um, I've tried to learn from all these disciplines the tools that I need in order to think about the things I can't help but think about. Like Socrates had a daimon, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't trust anyone that does philosophy because they know what they're doing. It's just sort of like an incurable itch or it's like a habit. <laughs> it's very hard to shake. You just find yourself thinking about things. And I, I, I found myself, I think from college, thinking increasingly with Indian thinkers and texts and environing myself with those traditions as well as with philosophers in the West. So that's why I'm here, I think. And also because I'm very lucky as, as are we all that get paid to do this, right? I think I got it's a concatenation of fortunate circumstances. Um, I'll say more about that maybe as we do. Sure. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, um, I'm sure we're gonna hear a little bit more about Sonam's um, uh, intellectual genealogy when we talk about the text itself, um, which we will in just just a moment. So, and, and in fact, I, um, before, um, I guess very briefly, I'm not sure, every 10, 15 minutes, maybe you're gonna give just a quick overview 
of certain okay. elements of the text. They're not going to be comprehensive. Um, I've asked um, someone in particular to talk about hell uh, because um, the question of whether or not we're going somewhere after death and the question of <laughs> what that experience will be like um, or if we can experience it now is something um, that I think um, uh, is, is extremely compelling and it is one of many, many compelling questions. So I think in his overview, he's gonna discuss particularly the issue of hell and how it's understood in the work of Vasubandhu. But please, Sonam, the floor uh, is yours. Oh, wow, thank you, Nick. Okay, so what I have for you is, is, is a little medley, it's like a bouquet of textual passages that I hope will thread together um, to introduce not just the, the intellectual content of the book, but also a little bit about the rasa or the sabo with which um, I, I would love for it to be taken up and with which I think um, Vasubandhu's own writing is bound up. But I'll, I'll start by reading from the conclusion of Other Lives uh, because it's one of the more honest passages, I think. So here goes, it's a, it's a, it's a couple of paragraphs. As was his practice, from time to time, the venerable Maha Mokkalyayana would journey through the realms of hell and journey through the animal realm and journey through the realms of hungry ghosts, the gods and humans, end quote. And thus begins the story of Saha Sadgata and the divine stories. I think it's one of the most effective openings for any short story that I know perhaps only rivaled by the terse beginning of its close cousin, the story that introduces the Mahavastu, which begins thus. Now, the venerable Mahamadgalyayana often went on a visit to hell, end quote. Often, and as was his practice, the effect of these qualifiers and juxtaposition with such uncanny destinations is something else. Why would anyone wish to travel to such places? How do you get there? Why go there more than once? Vasubandhu, like Mahamodgalyayana, this is my thesis, you understand, in other lives, is a traveler. Also, I would argue, given the intellectual journey that is the 20 verses. But why did Vasubandhu have us visit the realms of the hungry ghosts of hell? Mahamodgalyayana sometimes seems to me to be an anthropologist among the damned going beyond a confirmation of received Buddhist truths of action and consequence, karma and pala, he even collects the poems of hungry ghosts, thereby allowing readers the opportunity to redirect their attention to the unsuspected forms suffer can take and to the various ways in which it can be experienced by those we typically overlook. But what would Vasubandhu have us take away from his journey? So that's the question with which really Other Lives is written. It's about the 20 verses by Vasubandhu, and as Nick said, a compact but endless work. But it's not about the entirety of this book, um, about 20 verses. It's really about the opening and the conclusion of the work. It's about its frame, uh, the appeal to these alternate and alternating contexts of experience that seem to pull us out of the frame of the normal human waking experience that typically serves as a philosophical norm. So I have two more things to say before we open it up for conversation. Typically coming to a work like this, if your training is in Anglophone philosophy, particularly analytic philosophy is practiced in unfortunately the vast majority. I say this as a student trained in analytic philosophy. Unfortunately, the, the overwhelming norm now in Anglophone departments in, in North America, you're typically given the following advice. And this is actually, a, this could be a quote, I'll set aside the quoting and the, and, the, and the source for this, but you often hear something like the following, work on only those aspects of your material that could be published in the leading journals of your field today. So basically interact with just what is most easily translatable, submittable and peer reviewable in the leading journals of today, right? So what you're really doing often enough when you're studying Indian philosophy in Anglophone context is providing pre-modern Indian answers um, to contemporary questions uh, that are readily intelligible. Right? And so one of the things that immediately will come across is that things like hell are gonna be an embarrassment, right? And so if you're a student like me, you're going through school, there are gonna be moments where you're gonna shy away from the Mahamad Kalyayanas of the world 
the early bots, bits of the Vasubandhu, and you're going to gravitate to moments like this in the questions of Upali, the Upali Paripracha, where the Buddha finally admits, you know what, hell does not exist. So my answer to Nick's question, um, launch, uh, advertising the session was, does hell exist? And well, at least in the Upali Paripracha, the Buddha comes out and says, you know what, it doesn't. He admits that he's been teaching it. He's been exhibiting it and providing visions to people left and right of hell and the tortures and the horrific circumstances of rebirth. But hell does not exist, nor do the, the torturers with their swords and lances and their daggers. It is vikalpa. It is somehow an imaginative projection that provides for um, the reality, the visceral felt reality of hell and um, experiences of pain there. And so too heaven, pleasures don't exist. It's all the culpa. Are you going to think someone like me, a student's going to be like, oh, good, goody, goody. So there is epistemic continuity. I can talk to these guys. We have something in common. Um, it forms a kind of epistemic bridge. And Chandra Kirti, when he cites this passage, he even goes on to provide even more ammunition for us by saying, look, it's only the image of the bala the kids who dream up of these ideas of hell, and the pundits do it only when they want to scare us into acting moral, right? So you've got your basic package, A, hell does not exist, and this kind of traffic with hell is more suspect. This is the sort of stuff kids and moralists do. I mean, we serious philosophers don't really about this. Okay. Now, to work myself out of that, I have to sounds like I did something great, but I didn't. I, I just mean that there are two claims here. One is whether hell exists or not. And then I think so, a lot of people are going to be happy to suppose that Buddhists are capable of saying, even pre-modern Buddhists, hell and heaven in these regions don't exist. But there's another thesis that's more complicated. And here, I think Chandrakirti was too quick. Even if it exists or doesn't exist, what are we doing when we dream of hell or think about hell or talk as if hell in places like this exist? And here, I think the matters are far more complicated than simply saying that any reference to hell or alternate context of experience or cosmological imagination um, or narratological imagination where we push the boundaries of what we, we presume possible or not is always invested in some kind of narrow-minded morality or moral instruction. I think it's actually intellectually a fascinating question. What are we doing? Um, and what were they doing? when they were taxing our, our imagination in these ways. So the book really is an attempt to answer that question for Vasubandhu and to make a claim for why hell and other regions of experience were good to think beyond the question of narrow-minded moral instruction. And the answer is, at least the one I try to propose, is that cosmology, more broadly, provides Vasubandhu and thinkers maybe in his orbit with a conceptual laboratory of sorts in which to think about life as a space of variation in which no one form of life or no one form of experience serves as a paradigmatic norm and where you can start thinking then about the implications for this for various kinds of parameters with which we describe life, be it consciousness, embodiment, gender, sex, things like this, right? Like how do they relate to each other what is their status, which of any are fundamental, et cetera, et cetera. So basically it forms a meta-conceptual toolkit of considerable scope and power. That's the thesis of other lives. I actually think going forward, it'll be even more interesting to take forward the idea of how many such toolkits do they have and how do they relate? Like how do the pure lands relate to the, the worlds formed by karma and how does possibility differ in these two cases? Like, does it work that karma is more like historical outcomes by which we are bound as opposed to pure possibilities unconstrained by our common histories in the pure lands and so on. So it's Stephanie Balkwell is doing wonderful work looking at pure land sutras with gender in that way. Um, I wanted to quote Emerson to capture the taste of what I think Vasubandhu was doing. Uh, this didn't make it in the book, so I feel like I should give Emerson his uh, his. This is from a little book called, unhappily called The Spiritual Emerson. Um, I do not recommend that adjective, but it very handily ties in. And I happen to read this. This sounds like I'm making it up. 
but I actually was given this the day I sent my file in for the book. And I, of course, wouldn't you know it, the chapter is called Fate. And I looked at it and went, well, shit, I should have used this. Um, so here are the sentences that didn't make it into the book, but which I think capture the way in which cosmology informs Vasubandhu's intellectual thinking and that we can talk about in more detail together. So here's Emerson. But to see how fate slides into freedom and freedom into fate, observe how far the roots of every creature run or find if you can a point where there is no thread of connection. Our life is consentaneous and far related. This knot of nature is so well tied that nobody was ever cunning enough to find the two ends. Nature is intricate, overlapped, interweaved, and endless. And the hypothesis of other lives, the case that I try to make in the book is that cosmology actually works a little bit like the way the natural philosophy began to work in the 18th century and after in, in a European context, where it gave them conceptual tools um, to think again about uh, creatures in, in, as natural phenomena, but in, in incredibly tightly interconnected ways with life as a whole, which creates conceptual pressure um, on the categories which we try to describe any one phenomenon within that intricate way. Um, so that's the take. That's Other Lives as an attempt to provide that toolkit for us to um, follow along today. Thanks. That's it. That's that's the best stab I have, Nick. That is or, great. Um, no, that's, that is really good. And obviously, you know, we're, 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 we'll work through um, uh, a number of different bits. And um, people um, are free to... Um, start to put questions in. Um, it can be questions based on something that you've read in the text, of course, and it can be questions that are based on um, someone's intro or more general questions. Um, naive questions are welcome. Um, <laughs> please, right? Um, so um, uh, uh, someone is willing to talk about any aspect of Indian Buddhist philosophy. Um, no matter what it is, right? Um, so um, go where we, go where it will. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that um, were nagging at me as I was reading, and I suppose that's probably the best um, way to proceed um, for the next half hour, forty minutes or so. Um, and I have a sort of brief preface um, in which I try to see whether or not I've captured. Um, at least the spirit, if not the letter of Sonam's text. So Sonam, if I get it wrong, let me know. Okay. Um, uh, and so at the end of this, these sort of short um, attempts at summarizing these topics, um, there will be a question. <laughs> um, so the first one I have is about the question generally about literature and philosophy. And um, um, based on what I, uh, my, my take based on your book, I felt that the lyrical quality of your philosophical writing is clearly influenced by the lyrical tradition of South Asian storytelling about how worlds outside of one's conscious experience are essential to understanding the course of our lives. In many respects, I see your book as an attempt to stretch philosophical analysis to cover something which it seems on the face of it, it was never designed to cover events and worlds outside of experience. After all, how can we derive truth from dreams, right? This is crazy, <laughs> right? Uh, Anglophone philosophy, for example, has long left Freud in the dust, right? And he was a modern just like that. And worse, how can one reasonably expect to derive truth from the experience of beings such as hungry ghosts or animals or beings damned to torture in hell? It strikes me that if philosophy is to be in service of this project, either to Vasubandhu or to we moderns, it must countenance an expansive literary mode willing to dive deeply into the world of imagination, the world of story. Um, something which, by the way, before I encountered Deleuze, I never thought of as being in relationship to one another. That's perhaps my own limitation. 
uh, or, or, or for modern French orientation, but the, the, the critical and the clinical project, the bringing together of literature and philosophy is something that I hadn't heard of beforehand and, and had not seen too much of in the context of Indian philosophy. Um, how important is my question, how important then is literature and in particular the South Asian literary imagination to this philosophical project? And are we talking about philosophy being forced into service for the purpose of literature, or is that putting it too strongly? Oh, that's a, a um, what a lovely question. So first, I, I thank you. I, I hope the book has um, some merits at the level of style. Um, that's a, that's a, that would be a tremendous thing. It would not have been conscious if I, so. It may be a case of my, as you were saying, picking up on the um, the qualities of the literature to which I'm paying attention in, in this book, and uh, for which I'm trying to make a case. The, this the larger issue, um, the uh, the claims of imagination and practices of the imagination of imaginative writing um, on more strictly analytic modes and its, and its history in different regions of the world at different times is a wonderful issue. And I think it, 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 we're only really now getting a grip on how extensive the resources for answering that question are and how much we have to take into account, right? It's, it wasn't always the case in early modern Europe that imagination came apart from analysis or that like, there's a story to be told of how the grad grinds of the world want to banish imagination from the realm of facts, right? There's a history to that too, as Laureen Dastin has brought out. And it's interesting, Nick, I don't, I think, I think there's a story to be told at different periods and different times in South Asia of the tensions between modes of rhetorical persuasion that appeal to a certain kind of posture of exactitude and, and um, uh, responsiveness to just what is the case, like Yathartam or Yathabhutam, as distinct from modes of, or, uh, or postures of writing and composition that pull on us uh, through different modalities, like either through Rasa or by or seduce, seducing us through different ways, right? This is a South Asian way of putting it. Um, so the, the, I, I want to respond to it by acknowledging um, just how difficult it can be at different places, in different genres, in different regions, at different times, even in certain individuals, to mark that boundary. Right? So I, was, I was just thinking of this today. I, I just happened to think of like Ananda Vardhana, a great literary critic, who also wrote essays on uh, philosophical topics, like on semantics and stuff. He himself draws a distinction between uh, the what what poets do when they're composing and what philosophers do based on their, the poets are generative, whereas poet, philosophers tend to be responsive to what there is rather than creating new worlds or flooding the banks of feeling. So these, these tensions I think are felt in, in different places at different times and in different ways. That being said, I think you put your finger on something that's animating this book. It's that I think Basubandhu is far more, this is my hypothesis, I, I, I venture this, I don't know if it's true. I think there's a twofold, there's a twofold appeal to literature, if I may use literature broadly. So look broadly to include Katha as well as Natya, as well as, you know, these different genres of narrative storytelling that uh, may or may not be formally belles lettres or not. Let's just say literature, narrative, wherever we find it. So there's a twofold um, function that literature plays for Vasubandhu. One is it provides them with test cases, with exemplar of, of possibilities, right? And here it's like, if you want to say, well, what can happen? Where are we going to look? We say, okay, look, here's a narrative, so and so, that, that shows us something of what's possible. But the other thing I think that's provided for by these stories and is bound up with the traditions of telling these stories and receiving these stories and interpreting them uh, are norms of attunement to reality. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean something like it's not enough. Hmm. When do you know that you're in touch 
with reality as such that you are actually that a story has captured something not just of what is uh, that it tastes right it feels correct that this what you're being given is not a tall tale but really expressive of something like dharma dal whatever word you want to use and here certain kinds of rasa seem to work like adbutam or wonder or surprise or like ascharya and so the analytic work of showing you a possibility can't be here disentangled from um, the narrative logical work of attuning you to be receptive to it as a true possibility as opposed to like a, of confabulation or something like that. That's my hypothesis. I think that what's happening in the 20 verses is um, partly that he's asking maybe just himself. He could be the chief interlocutor for work, like his former self or his other self or the analytic self. He's asking for a readjustment and an acknowledgement that reality is going to have to be considerably stranger than was captured in a certain way of framing the subject of, of epistemology narrowly construed. At least it was going to have to be if what the Buddhist scriptures and the Buddhist tradition says is true. So the way it's come down to us narratologically. Um, and uh, in its world building elements shows us that the world was very different from what was being narrowly captured in these, these again, narrowly construed philosophical categories, perception, inference, and reasoning in a very narrow key. So that enlargement of our sense of what is possible and the attunement to the sense of it as, as, um, as successfully capturing reality rather than taking us away. But this is, this, I put this forward first as a band, as a hypothesis, and I, as an invitation to do much more work. Uh, is, I don't know, I don't expect anyone to read the footnotes. I hope no one does. This is a book only to be judged by its cover and then burnt <laughs> um, as, a, as, as an unfortunate pandemic offering. But there's this one footnote where I say, and I think this is me being honest again, I don't know always how Vasubandhu thinks about possibility and to what he looks. Um, and there are stories and there are stories. And some of these stories are like natural historical reports, which is the way science used to be done for so long, right? Until we got the, these conceptions of law-like explanations, you tell stories and you collect anecdotes and you collect observations and they are passed down. Uh, so the, the, there are stories of plenty in, in Vasubandhu. Yeah, okay, here's how I'll put it. Reading Vasubandhu, it's hard to know sometimes when you're being given an extraordinary detail about our world, say about the behavior of turtles and the crazy things they can do. It's actually a case. So why were the Abhidharma because obsessed with turtles? And it, it, and it turned it did right. And it turns out there's like this natural historical tradition seemingly connecting Central Asia and, and Latin West and, and these guys in the Northwest of the subcontinent. That's fascinating. And then there are also stories that seem to give perfectly quotidian details of extraordinary worlds, right? It'll be like about the daily habits of Pratas. And it's like, well, I mean, and it's, it's hard to know where the line is between these, right? So I think there are these, these all these functions, the, 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 the Rasika element of attunement and the analytic work of collecting possibilities and enlarging and framing. Um, so yeah, these interweave, I think, for Vasubandha whether it does so for South Asia as a whole. That, that's a whole different thing. I can see Dharmotra saying, last yeah. thing you want to do is bring in these bloody stories. <laughs> right? um, but yeah, thank you. That's a, what a wonderful question. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, 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 there's a few points which I want to drill down on um, in terms of what you've said already, um, particularly around the issue of perception, but I'm going to hold off on uh, the issue of perception um, for just a moment, because I want to sort of um, ask um, if I've got Vasubandhu's thesis correct, um, uh, and um, and sort of um, get a more general overview of the problem of objects um, from you before we talk about the problem of perception that you alluded to uh, briefly. A, a quick word on the issue of perception and and in, in and. Um, the, the problem of getting at reality itself, as you put it. Um, I, I've, I've long thought that there is a moment in South Asian intellectual history that is, goes far beyond the Buddhist intellectual sphere that is 
perhaps invaded or maybe even infected <laughs> Buddhist intellectual life that perhaps is part of the reason why it is that we look at issues of literariness, uh, the imagination and karma itself uh, as being less significant than they should be as starting premises for um, South Asia. And some of it will have to do, I think, with the question of perception, the focus on perception. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. I just wanna pull back for a moment to make sure that I've got Basubandhu's thesis about how living beings experience the karmic cycle uh, of life, death, and that in-between stage that you talk about uh, in the book as well, um, uh, correctly. So you say that Basubandhu is writing the 20 verses to correct opponents who fundamentally misunderstand the character of human and non-human experience. Um, and one of the ways in which um, um, experience can be gotten wrong is the focus on objects. Objects seem to be a theme in the way that you talk about Basubandhu. They are not benign. They are serious problems and being objective is more like a, an assault on the spirit than it is a, a rational virtue, right, in, uh, in, in this context, right? And so I thought it was worth pulling back, maybe even for the benefit of the audience as well, to think about the role that objects play as an organizing problem for Vasubandhu, and uh, in particular how this question of this seemingly um, positive element in South Asian intellectual life of trying to perceive the object properly or correctly, getting proper perception of the object, why should that be a problem? Why should that be an issue? Um, but let me back up here for just a moment. So correct me if I'm wrong here on this account of Vasubandhu's thesis. He seems to think that human and non-human, that's to say the experience of living beings is structured according to two foundational elements. Basically, there's a pair. There's, a, there's a, an agent um, who grasps at reality, who grasps at uh, um, objects, uh, things in their perceived reality, and then there is the thing that they grasp at. It seems like there's also potentially a third moment, which is to say the awareness of that grasping and being grasped. So there's sort of two or possibly three elements that really are foundational for thinking about what it means to be a living being. This is what we do. We are graspers, right? Uh, when we're not being grasped. So the pattern of this pattern of behavior, I would say in many respects, in common sense language, putting aside Indian philosophy, any philosophy, is a natural part of human behavior. We want, we wish, we desire. Marx, of course, looked at human greed and said, this is what we are, obviously, and we must remedy this, right, through the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is a problem. We are graspers. It is a deep psychological disease that we have, and it doesn't mean you don't, you don't have to be Vasubandhu to recognize that being a grasper is a problem for the human being. It warps us, it distorts us. But returning to Vasubandhu, it is a way of being that Vasubandhu says turns us, turns us into a sort of object hungry being. We experience the whole world naturally as objects, seemingly solid entities that govern our lives, train the way we think. Objects are those things we take for granted, presumed to be immovable truths about our life, everything from the nation and family to houses, clothing, food, abstract, tangible objects are everywhere and they govern and control us. Basubandhu seems to say that we view objects as the structures of our experience and that no experience is possible without them, at least in normal workaday life. This grasper grasp mode that feeds our experiential loops is what produces our common sense notion of experience of hey, that's just how it is. Um, and that this grasp or grasp mode is what Basubandhu refers to as a kind of habituation. Uh, and the role of Buddhist philosophy ideally is to guide living beings away from these habits formed lifetime after lifetime through the experience ultimately of an awakening, right? There's a soteriology that comes at the end of this, right? It's supposed to reverse this way of being. This is a big picture question, but what precisely is so bad about objects for Vasubandhu. I've tried to express it in a couple different ways just now, but 
throw everything I just said away. <laughs> what is so fundamentally problematic about objects for Vasubandhu? Why are they so deleterious and why are they so all encompassing for the experience of living beings? Damn. Um, first, let me say that's an extraordinary um, portrait that I don't think I had sensed, but which I, I really like the way you have taken seriously the language of grasping and, and followed it through into its, um, uh, through its metaphorical associations and its technical work. I, I really, um, I'm tempted not to say anything after that and just let it stand as an exclamation mark and say, damn, I, I, I hope that's what my book is suggesting. Um, I should say, so this is how Dan, I think this is how Dan Lusthaus um, in Buddhist phenomenology would read uh, the larger arc of Yogacara Buddhism as and, and as picking up on what they take to be the central thrust of the Buddhist tradition. I think it's how um, this remarkable Indian, um, uh, I mean, Indian citizen and also a student of Indian Buddhism, uh, Bibhuti Yadav, would have talked about Vasubandhu. This is how he talked about the Madhyamika as well, but he would say that one of the fundamental well, one of the fundamental reasons we project a world as if independent from us, as if out there in the form of objects, is so that we can appropriate it. So it's like the, um, right, there's this kind of, uh, 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 I mentioned Freud earlier, almost like a drive to orient ourselves to the world in certain ways to satisfy these pre these. Uh, pre-thematically available pre-conscious drives and thirsts and, and needs that we seem to have um, not just as cultural beings, as almost as species beings, right? These things individuate us and shape the ways in which we encounter the world. So I think both Dan Lusthaus and Bibhuti Yadav would have loved the way you phrased it. And I think they would have said Vasubandhu is indeed saying something like this. And then we can talk philologically of whether it's grasping or taking up like upalab like seizing or picking up and, and what kind of meditative practices can help us deconstruct these things. But you asked this question about, you know, stepping back from that, what's the problem with objects? Right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a fair question. What's he got against Artha? And you, you, you already answered partly the stakes here are that Vasubandhu himself, well, some people credit this as a definition of perception uh, this definition of perception I'm about to offer as Vasubandhu's own, it's in the Vata Viti. Um, some like Dignaga say it's not Vasubandhu, or if it is Vasubandhu, it's a young Vasubandhu, postdoc Vasubandhu, not tenured Vasubandhu. But it'll, it'll set up the stakes by con connecting perceptual acquaintance with objects. So the language of something, an event of awareness, counts as a perceptual episode if it derives from the object it presents. And so there's something about like, or be, the beholdenness of an event to what there is is what makes it perceptual. But that's when we're in contact, that the mind hits reality. And now the question is, what's wrong with that picture for Vasubandhu, right? I think, I think let's let's say two things, and I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna burden my answer with defense right now. I'm just gonna offer the, the answer, what I take to be the answer. Partly built into the language of objects for Vasubandhu is a kind of independence from us, right? That he thinks is problematic. So I think he thinks on the one hand, what we are doing when we are treating content as an object is we are crediting it with a separability from us, from the, from the kinds of beings we are, and um, with the kind of invariance or a normative status to where we think that what serves as an object should be the standard against what every other uh, possible content is measured. And what I mean by that is that if I take what's happening right now, you in conversation with me, this cup over here, as an object, I'm implicitly laying claim to the way reality shows up for us uh, over against the ways it could show up for other creatures. Right? One is the separation from uh, us, our histories, our um, abilities to be in conversation with each other um, and then the privileging of that frame as somehow being closer to what there is anyhow, other, apart from other frames. 
I think he thinks that's problematic. I think he thinks it will occlude to us um, what for him is pragmatically important about experience to underscore, which is that what shows up for us in experience is constrained not by something ultimately separable from us, but something so bound up with us in our past that we could not describe it as an object if we were to be true to the way it's entangled with us. And that's um, that that description is actually more objective, if we want to use that language, than is the appeal um, to locate the, uh, the source of our experiences in something beyond us, completely beyond us. Right. So I, th I think what he, I, I think the problematic nature of objects is it, it occludes um, the, the role of the past in conditioning what is available to us rather than what there is. And it includes, it includes, I think, normativity. I think really for Vasugandhi, one of the reasons to focus on our history of conditioning and all that we have done that sets up what is possible for us to experience is that that's, a, that's ultimately going to be a normative story. Um, and bringing that kind of normativity into view is important to unseat our reliance and our frame as like somehow privileged or just closer to reality as anyhow or somehow magically um, uh, given to us. You, you, I'm like, no, no, I'm just going to start throwing words and I'm not going to get clearer. Um, but the, there's something deeply problematic about this idea that we can jump out of our skins and out of our history to be in contact with reality denuded of his, of that of those features yeah that's that's great and um and i think that 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 the idea that that we are projecting um, um these objects that there's something as an impulse is the word that you use right that there's that there's an impulse in us to 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 erect not as individuals even right but collectively erect these 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 prisons of object mm. all around us such that we structure our own existence without even having known it right there's something very um yes um problematic about that right and and, and obviously and, then, yeah, and you mentioned marx right so one one very problematic um uh, effect of scaffolding our experience in terms of these objects is we think that this is how things are as opposed to right. one way they could be and that there are other ways we can be Right, that, that, that the, the injection of possibility back into the account is going to be super crucial for um, these therapeutic reasons and meliterative reasons that are going to be important to Vasubandhu and important to his Buddhism. Like, I think that's where, where he sees the thrust of his own religion um, is in, in, right, in, that, in those forward looking dimensions. Thank you. That I, I, that's, I think so. That I think the appeal to Marx actually, we could get into like. The exact way this would work, but I, I think there's something right there about the spirit of the thesis. Yeah, I mean, so I mean that right. So that that way of framing the problem of the object, I think, is great. Thank you for that. I, it's wonderful. And 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 sort of where I wanted to go next with it, all of this, of course, being derived from your book, right? All of this is everything I'm saying is coming right out of your book and your wonderful explanations of these of these concepts and and. Um, um, taking on um, sort of the, the biggest boogeyman out there. Um, for those of you who are not thinking about Indian philosophy on a regular basis, this may seem like um, a relatively small point, but one of the most important ways in which Indian philosophy, not just Buddhist philosophy, I think, tried to deal with the problem of these object prisons out there, this world of objects which constrain our experience, limit our capacity to understand ourselves and the world around us. Um, one of the supposed antidotes was the idea that you would have an authoritative cognition, right, of perception, that you would be able to have, you could, you could pare down your interaction with objects such that you would see I mean, to use something that's more ideologically laced, right? You take a look at a piece of advertising out there, right? And you see through it. You see the lies that it's promoting. You see the supposed lifestyle of that product. And you're like, ah, that's not going to happen, right? If I smoke, I'm not going to become a cowboy, right? The idea is somehow that if you have a naked, clear-eyed, immediate, direct perception with an object out there, that you're going to be able to understand it. You're going to see through it. 
and you're going to be able to actually have an experience of reality. In other words, you'll be able to cut through the distortions and illusions that come with this projection of objects out there, right? Um, so perception, right? Perception is something which seems like it should be an authoritative cognition, a way to go, that maybe the best way to go in order to get immediate contact with reality. And yet the perception of an object seems to be, or correct perception of an object, seems to be so fundamentally problematic to Vasubandhu, was my sense, that it all, it's not the case, but it almost feels like there's a kind of revulsion toward epistemology. Um, I know that epistemology comes back in. I know that, there, that cognition does become important of, of, a, of an object in the moment and so on. I know that it, it does come back later in, 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 in his text, but there seems to be a fundamental problem with it. And it seems to have to do with this issue of causality and karma. Well, and like so you... I wanted to ask you, why is um, perception as an authoritative cognition limited? Why is it problematic for Vasubandhu? And what is it that we should be doing with objects that allows us to get past them? What is that in particular soteriological orientation that we should have toward the treatment of objects such that we are released from their distorting grasp? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really lovely. So, okay, let me, let me um, uh, gather up some of the points that we made in the conversation and add to what you just added about um, the, the promise of epistemological the epistemological promise of appeals to perception in South Asian discourses, which I think is spot on. So, so here are the problems with objects. So the first thing we said is that it, it, it points to a kind of separability um, of the world from us and uh, suggesting that we could ground our experiences in something ultimately distinct from us, which is a problem. It, 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 it orients us to our experiences as, as of the world as it supposedly is and includes from us possibilities. There's a story about how it has come to be, to seem to be this way, and that what, there are different ways it could come to be. And then you've just added the third thing, which is really lovely. There's this belief sometimes expressed that we could pry apart our experiences or sift or sort them into those that are already in contact with reality and those that are erroneous or projective or something. And it's a very optimistic picture that we are already at some level in contact with reality, as opposed to thinking that being in touch with reality is an achievement, not a given. It takes a considerable amount of work, right? I, I think that's absolutely right. I think this, this um, what Vasubandhu in a way is trying to do is suggest that given the creatures we kind we are right now, given what creatures are anyway, and given how environments for creatures come into being through the history of action of those creatures, and how tightly coupled creatures and their environments are, there couldn't be something like, like a perceptual contact with reality as it is um, independent of us in anything like a given sense we have to break out of our conditioning and that takes a lot of work. So Buddhas maybe, we can talk about perceptual awareness or non-conceptual awareness, but that takes an, it's an in-principle possibility rather than something we can take as a default, right? I love that. It's, it's like, it's, it's the ultimate form of bias uh, training. It's saying, no, good luck. <laughs> and, you know, so we're not even clear where you're gonna get started with this idea, this, the, we, we are, we are we are formed of priming condition, conditioning and priming all the way down. Right? This, in fact, so much so that you cannot point to something in our, in our visual fields, our sensory fields, our awareness fields, that is not of a piece with our conditioning. Like, right? this, you can't just go in there and start prying around and saying, if you cut around the dotted line here, you get um, reality as it is anyhow, the rest of its conditioning. So, the, the object language talk is a way of, um, let's say it's a more optimistic portrayal of our situation than Vasubandhu wants to allow. Now, that having been said, sorry, that was my summary of like your beautiful way of putting things, but what was the question you asked me just now? 
Yeah, so the question, yeah, uh, I appreciate that. So the question though is, um, what is the problem with simply going for perception from a yeah. perspective? What, and in particular, uh, um, what is it about the deep history of objects? What is, the, what is it about the deep history, especially the karmatic history of things that we must countenance um, rather than just the momentary understanding of a given phenomenon um, under, our, under our perceptual microscopes? Yeah, I think so. I think um, there are different ways of framing it depending on how Buddhist we want to build in, build how much Buddhism we want to build into our answer to begin with. But I think, all right, let's let's um, let's say two things, and we'll keep I'll keep it short. One is our ways of experiencing the world, bound up with a certain claims to objectivity on our part, is rife with suffering, our own and suffering imposed on others. And there's something, there's, so there's something, um, uh, it's like you want to take a therapeutic look at the ways in which we talk and think and, and, and see to ourselves certain kinds of epistemic authority and say, what if there's something massively wrong um, with the way we are, with our self-understanding and it has to do with this picture. I think that's going to be part of the story is that certain ways of describing ourselves promote suffering ultimately and certain ways are going to going to point to its amelioration. But the, the other thing to say, uh, and this is the more um, theoretical thing to say, even aside from the therapeutic framing, I think partly what Subban is saying, it's a completely shitty way to start um, by assuming that we already know everything we need to know about experience just by focusing on this one case of humans, not just the one case of humans, but just their waking experiences and just the waking experience of so-called normal human experiences. So I think that he's going to, what he's pointing out in the Vimshadika, or the Vimshadika, is that this is theoretically unsatisfying. We're going to get something fundamentally wrong. We're going to start making wrong claims about what experiences are and what their conditions are if we start this way. So the right way is not to begin with the very narrow category of perceptual success, but to begin with a more open category of experiential content and then see where that's found. Right? Because there's something, uh, there's, perception is not a descriptive term, it's a normative term, it's like a success term. So let's not start there. Let's start with something like Bhignyapti, that even the Prathas have, that even beings in hell have, that even insects have. Um, and let's see what the conditions for that are. And then let's get our account. And then let's talk about perception with respect to that. You see what I mean? It's like, it's like where do we start? It's kind of like William James starting with saying, let's look at the full range of the diversity of cases that humans, like of consciousness, right? You can't start with one. You're gonna need a, a wide field to get a theoretical grip on the categories we need. And I think that's the, the gesture that's happening. Right. So I think then, just, I sort of wanna ask one more sort of general question now about the issue of, of, of how it is we, how it is that Basubandhu, and this is I think the most challenging we, okay, fine, you want to reject the idea of um, direct perception as the best way to understand how it, what it means to be a living being, what it means to be alive, what it means to understand yourself and the world. Okay, fine, that's legitimate. Go down the rabbit hole of a particular karmic path or kar karmic fate, particular karmic destiny, right? Whether it's a being who is confined to hell or whether it's an animal or what have you, right? Um, and this is not this is not post-humanist um, ethics, right? This is, this is taking the existence of uh, an animal, having this experience of um, Vignyapti seriously. Mm. What do they go through? How do they experience their world? And in particular, a nasty world and a problematic world, depending on how hard you up are on, on the 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 um, the the uh, life uh, food chain, right? Um, it can be a terrible. It's how do you get access to that um, if you are trapped in your own experience? Uh, and you have a wonderful discussion of this at the end, which we probably won't have time to talk about right now. But you talk about overlooking uh, as a way of discussing um, um, that kind of more clear soteriological practice-based orientation, or at least you push us to think about that, but I'm not going to deal with that, that for just a moment. It's just how do you, in your own embodied state, right, 
make that jump to get contact with, to have that, uh, 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 to, to jump tracks as it were into the realm of the hell being and so on. And so yeah. one of the things I wanted to ask you about was this um, uh, uh, wonderful discussion, which you can't do justice to, I guess, in a couple of minutes, but um, virtuality and the importance of virtuality as, I don't know what I want to call it, a technique, uh, yeah. a, a mode of philosophizing, um, which it seems is largely overlooked by people who are interested in um, the pramana of, of, of perception. Um, so if you talk about how does one empathize with another being, given that we are trapped in our experience almost by definition, and there's, you can talk about it in any way you want, but um, the idea of a, a virtual approximation of the experience of the other is one way in which I, I was compelled by your argument. This is, a, this is a lovely, this is, I, I don't think I had fully put this together. Um, so here I must say, I, I've been very influenced also by work done by other Buddhologists, uh, such as on the Smriti Upasthana Sutra and work by people like Andy Rotman on the Abhidhana or Amber Carpenter or Fall is going to be in the audience, I think, and like um, stuff that they've gotten and think about. So, okay, I think this is a great question. I don't think Vasubandhu is a skeptic. I don't think he thinks we are caught up in one embodied mode to the exclusion of our ability to, to A, sense and B, partake of other perspectives. So, but how, how do you get out of it? Like, a, I can imagine a Zhuang, like you can imagine the Zhuangs are saying something very differently here. Well, I think there are three things to say, um, at least, probably many more. I'm gonna say three things, All right? And, well, um, and I'm gonna preface it with something my daughter said that can believe forward me on the way to school. I think she got this from the magic school bus. I think you might, you've seen this on Twitter, right? She just suddenly stops and goes, and she's looking at a squirrel, and she's looking at what the squirrel's looking at. And she said, you know, we don't actually know what we're seeing till we, till we take into account all the animals and everything they're seeing because they're not seeing the same thing. So I, I really think that something of that spirit is going on in Vasubandhu's appeal to cosmology and stuff. Okay, so how do we, how do we, how do we get access to these, these myriad different ways of experiencing from the inside, so to speak? This takes us back to your question about literature. I think it's massively important to, to think about the, the cognitive and experiential affordances of literature in this way, right? Partly what literature is doing is broadening the points of view available to us to entertain, particularly the karmic narratives, right? That's part of what's going on is like starting to learn how to pay attention to what the animal is feeling, do animals even have forms of smithy, and then on and on to these other worlds that start manifesting themselves as real and credible to the to participants in different uh, ways. And along with that, also the visceral experience, possibly, I think this is being entertained, that we are not a singular uh, uh, creatures either, that we ourselves from the inside have a diversity of ranges of experiences and contexts of experience. And this is where the dreams come in, certain other kinds of, we can touch, right, through meditation or uh, just the course of experience and through conditioning very many different kinds of experiences. And then we can bundle all of this together in more proactive ways through meditative training, where we, we don't just passively happen upon diversity of experiences. We don't just entertain sentences about other experiences. We try and pay attention to, and maybe even enact this full complement of diversity of uh, experiences. And, and we stage them virtually. Right? It's like we entertain other lives and make real other lives in certain kinds of programmatic ways. I do think um, there is a long history to be told about taking the yoga and yoga chara seriously. I don't do any of this in the book. Um, not out of disrespect for this long history, more out of respect for it. I think it's actually massively complicated and lots of stuff needs to be ironed now. But, um, and one person who's been forcing me to think about it uh, is Bryce Hubner, superb philosopher um, and also superbly humane being. But, just as we started out talking about the um, uh, embarrassment with cosmology, I think there's also an embarrassment with meditation and, or any kinds of attention practices um, that we'd have to overcome in order to take seriously the cultivation and sensitivity for virtual experiences that is, I think, in play here, right? So 
what I would say is um, to go forth and go boldly with the Buddhist commitment to the thought that we already touch on the full complement of diverse possible rebirths in a human life, even moment to moment sometimes. But we, we know what it's like to be in hell. Unfortunately, many do. And we know what it's like to be a Prather. And many of us know what it's like to be hunted and to have scarcity of resources and to feel fear, which is what it's to be an animal in some accounts, right? Um, or, or I love this moment in Vasubandhu where he says, actually animals in, can be in heaven because they experience pleasure there. So we know what it's like to be an animal insofar as even, even not just in our fearful bits, I wish I'd said this more clearly, but even when we experience joy and, and when animals experience joy, we have, we have, we can touch or taste a little of their experiential possibilities. We're not always as removed from them as we think. So that blurring of the lines between these, I think is super important. Um, and at least, I, I, and I think it's deeply true. I think that this, the, the um, elevation of humanity and it's cutting, being cut out is almost as if something like the way we treat objects. I think we have removed ourselves for too long from this blurred continuum of which we are a part and which it is the duty of a karmic narrative to stitch us, to, 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 to embed us back in. Um, right, I talk too much, I'm sorry, but it's a lovely question. Uh, I don't know what Vasubandhu would say, but I hope he would, I hope he would say something a little bit of these, these three things. And I do think it allows us to tie in your first question, your second question, and now this question, right? It's precisely this connectivity to the lives of others and our internal diversity and plurality, um, the, uh, the connectedness coming from this history of action that ties us all together and ties our forms of experiences together that gets excluded when we treat ourselves as objects or as in touch with objects. Um, I think that's, we'll have to work out exactly how, but I, I think that's really important for us. We, 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 we impose these barriers between contexts of experience and all that we have done to, to make them available to each other, uh, even if we don't remember them. Wonderful. Thank you so much.